happened the second day after the very successful, from my point of view, first day. And I thank you all. And, um, you know, it's a real privilege to go on with this Virax uh, healthy aging, following what, like uh, Karen said, uh, the, the Virax aging in King's College that uh, Richard Su mentioned yesterday and the two um, conferences at Tel Aviv University, uh, all those in person uh, in two, 2018 and 19. And here we are, a small change, not a big change, but we are looking on the screens and um, maybe, you know, it's just a lesson from nature uh, to be studied uh, and a great challenge to science and technology and to human values. Um, tackling this uh, short and long-term impact on the healthy aging. And we heard yesterday uh, Dame Shirley, say, uh, Shirley Porter saying uh, regarding the loneliness, but that's just one clue. Uh, and that's what we want to do. And thus, it's my very, very great privilege to um, invite our first, first speaker, the opening speaker, Professor Sarah Harper. Uh, she was physically in one of the first uh, healthy, uh, healthy aging uh, meetings in Tel Aviv. And I hope, as Karen said, that we'll meet all again. And I even, following the film that we saw in the beginning, I even hope it will be in Tel Aviv and then we'll move to the Dead Sea because there is a very interesting area for aging and benefit at the Dead Sea. Uh, so uh, Professor Sarah Harper is a Claw Professor of Gerontology, uh, the Oxford, uh, the Director of the Oxford Institute of Population Aging. Um, you know, it's, it's just a clue what, what she did that we are, are reading because she did a lot. Um, she, uh, Sarah served uh, on the UK Prime Minister Council for Science and Technology, advising Prime Ministers uh, David Cameron and, and Theresa May on the scientific evidence of strategic policies in relation to demography and aging, you know, these top uh, things. Sarah holds the Royal Society uh, for Public Health Award uh, for the impact on changing fertility and mortality patterns on the life course. She was the UK chair um, uh, at the uh, recent, the last, last year, Anglo-Israel Symposium on Aging held in Jerusalem two nine, uh, last year, as I said, and will share with us uh, the Jerusalem Declaration on Aging. So this is the best opening we could do. Please, Sarah. Thank you very much. Thank you, uh, Mira, and thank you, Karen, and your team uh, for including us. Um, uh, as Karen sort of inferred, uh, we've had some missed meetings. Um, I was meant to be presenting uh, this declaration along with Izzy Doran, who was my co-chair from the University of Haifa, uh, first of all in March uh, and then in June. Uh, and, but now, thankfully, um, due to your very kind invitation, we can share just a little with you. Um, we obviously uh, have a slightly truncated uh, uh, section. Uh, and so I'm just going to give you a taster uh, of what happened. And I have a PowerPoint and I am going to share my screen if I can. Oh, where am I? I'm here. Okay, let me just do this. Okay, so I'm going to talk to you um, about the Jerusalem Declaration uh, on Aging. Um, and this uh, came out of the Anglo-Israel Symposium, uh, which was held in November 2019. Um, and as I say, I was delighted to be invited to be that chair, uh, along with um, Professor Izzy Doran from the University of Haifa. Uh, and what we wanted to do was uh, to bring together academic scientists and policymakers and practitioners to really grapple with uh, what we called our future, our future aging. Uh, because as we know, um, actually the vast majority of countries across this century are going to age. Uh, and the themes we really wanted to look at were one, all societal aging. I mean, I'm a demographer, is, the, is a social psychologist. Um, so we're social scientists, 
and we really wanted to look at what was going to happen to society. We also really wanted to try to understand uh, inequalities, um, and we very much based it around the fact that we both have a very diverse uh, set of societies, and so we were delighted that um, we were able uh, to have participants, uh, both um, Jewish and Arab Israelis and Palestinians in the room, uh, discussing demographic aging and the impact it was having on their society. Uh, and then in the UK, we obviously have a huge um, inequality within our society, both socioeconomic uh, and ethnic, and we wanted to be able um, to represent that uh, as well. And the final thing we were determined uh, to be able to put on the table, and I'm delighted I, you have a, a, a talk this afternoon, I think, from Martin Hind, who is going to bring this up, was the life course. Aging doesn't just suddenly happen. Uh, what we do when we're younger has a huge impact uh, across our lives uh, and particularly has an impact on whether we have healthy aging or not. So this was our aging futures. These were the participants. Um, I'm going to talk a little bit about the declaration, but first of all, just very quickly, um, let you see that it was a real mix from both um, uh, countries, uh, that we ha did have academics, policymakers, we had people from the Cabinet Office uh, and from the Government Office of Science from the UK, we had the National Insurance Institute, the Ministry of Construction and Housing represented from Israel. Uh, and we started off with two big themes. One was on demography, and the second was a wonderful talk um, from Udi Gazit from the Gazit Lab about the biology of aging. So in other words, we have to understand individual aging, but we also must understand societal aging. The idea of the Jewish declaration came from my co-chair, Izzy Doran, who has really pushed this through. And I think what he wanted to do was to say, here is a statement of how we can tackle our aging futures. Um, this uh, is the uh, very basis of the declaration. Now, the declaration should have been formally uh, launched in March. Um, it has not yet been published. And indeed, because of this conference today, it is published both on the Oxford University website, that's my website at the bottom, or my institute's website, sorry, Institute of Population Aging, and also at the University of Haifa. Um, so we are publishing it today, um, uh, as this morning. And those of you who want to go on and read it, it will be there. But I understand that the Anglo-Israel um, Society is very um, keen, association, sorry, is very keen that we should have a formal um, publication sometime uh, in the future. I think you all have access to this document. Um, and you can just see from the titles uh, that we really were trying to bring together societal aging, uh, aging policy, data, and a variety of things that uh, affect us as we go through our lives. Um, I'm just going to pick out, because of the time, just three or four things, just to give you a taste um, of what we were talking about. Remember, this uh, has been written jointly by everybody you saw uh, on that first list. So it is not just scientists, it is also academics and policymakers uh, who have written it. Uh, and it is in the context of both individual aging and societal aging. So let's just look at one thing. Um, aging in the wider context. We felt very, very strongly that the first statement we had to make uh, is that population aging does not occur in a vacuum. Uh, at that time, we were talking a lot about climate change and about environmental change. Uh, and what was it about the aging of the population that might impact upon uh, environmental change? Now, of course, uh, we have added in um, pandemics because, uh, as I don't have to tell you, um, we have had to reframe this, not in the light of COVID, but in the light of what COVID has told us about uh, aging and living in an aging society. Uh, and I'll come to that uh, a little bit uh, in a minute. Uh, the other thing um, that I want to um, uh, highlight uh, is this one. Um, we were scientists, therefore we were really interested in the kind of available data we have. And I think this is a message, hopefully, to many people at the conference, uh, that we have real problems with some of the data uh, that we have to work with, particularly as social scientists. Um, in particular, uh, a lot of our data, which tends to be cross-sectional um, rather than longitudinal, has not in the past been sensitive to cohort changes in the aging process. Uh, we know, and, and the biologists and medical people at this conference know, uh, that we have seen a dramatic change, um, not among everyone, but definitely among the higher educated, those people with higher incomes uh, in both our societies, uh, an increase in physical and cognitive performance. Uh, and that if we compare chronological age and match it against 
uh, physical and cognitive performance in particular. Uh, and just go back 25 years, there's been a huge difference. Um, and we believe that um, because this hasn't been taken into account, um, the validity of chronological age as a marker of capacity or performance has been severely compromised. And we need uh, the funders and those people uh, who work on the very big data sets uh, to take this on board. And in particular, we argue that large scale longitudinal cohort comparative surveys are really required. Uh, and going forwards, I think, particularly in the light of COVID and what we've seen happening to older adults, uh, this is something uh, that we need uh, to stress uh, because as we say at the bottom, inferences that are based on data from past cohorts run the risk of misinforming uh, policy decisions. And, and I know those of us, I've obviously worked a lot with the UK government. Uh, and one of the issues we had was getting, we have very good uh, aging data in the UK, but even so, getting valid aging data that was relevant, not only to today's older adults, but also to future uh, older adults. Let's, um, obviously, I don't want to plough through, you know, work, health, uh, informal care, financial security like that. But I do want to pick up uh, on one of those, and that is health, because it seems relevant uh, to this. Um, I don't know whether you're aware, but the UK government, in fact, Theresa May, um, and this came out of part of the work that I did um, with, in particular, Tom Wells, um, who was at our conference, uh, and my work on the government's um, uh, uh, Council for Science and Technology, uh, we worked very hard, having done a big ageing review, to persuade uh, Theresa May to sign up to certain uh, things, and there was a lot of um, political goodwill at that time. Uh, and so one of the major policy aims we have in the UK now is to decrease the gap between life expectancy and healthy disability-free life expectancy. Um, and I know there are quite a few talks today that in a way are going to be very relevant to that. In fact, the UK government has said that by 2035, it wishes to reduce uh, the gap by five uh, years for everyone. Now to reduce it by five years for healthy professional middle-class uh, older adults uh, is one thing, but to really be able to do it to all members of our society, the socially disadvantaged and those from ethnic minorities is going to be a much bigger ask. We also um, thought a lot about our health systems. Uh, and again, you can see, we believe that we have to again within our health systems take a life course approach. Um, and what became very clear that there are still many health systems across the globe where when you reach a certain chronological age, you sort of fall into geriatric medicine. Uh, and, and this is something that although we need specialities and we need a holistic approach at the end of our lives, we have to have health systems that understand a life course uh, approach. And finally, and I, I think many of my colleagues in the room will um, agree with me, the status of both geriatric medicine and geriatric psychiatry in some way needs to be raised um, to attract highly qualified younger practitioners. Sadly, we all live in a world where there are people who are really committed to older adults, but there are others who sort of fall into uh, geriatrics um, uh, almost by default. Um, and we need people really committed uh, to gerontology, geriatric medicine, and geriatric psychiatry, and as we have seen, uh, actually uh, social care workers as well. So raise the st status of those uh, working with and caring for older adults. Uh, just two more. Um, this one, I think, has become even more important. Um, we had with us Ken Blackstone, who has worked um, for um, Age UK and um, Age International, who is absolutely committed to the idea of human rights and older adults. And we had a very big discussion. And I think at the moment um, there is sort of a spectrum. Uh, we have those people who are suggesting that um, all adults uh, should have the same human rights. One shouldn't in some way uh, say that older adults are in any way particularly special. I think there are others who are beginning to feel that, and particularly in the light of what we've seen across the globe through COVID, maybe in the same way as we have child human rights, we should be discussing uh, human rights specifically for older people. Uh, but I think probably where I would stand, where many of my colleagues would stand, is that age has to be a variable uh, within our understanding of human rights. Just as we have obviously ethnicity and we have gender uh, recognized, uh, we also uh, must have um, age recognized. So we argued, hang on, I'm just, that um, age-based discrimination and age bias is 
everywhere. And I think COVID has shown us that we live in institutionally ageist societies. And I think many of the people who have acted in an ageist way would be horrified if they knew that that's what they had done. But it is institutionalized, uh, that this must be recognized as harmful. And we need a much more clearer articulation of how older people's rights can be protected. Uh, and I know the UN has recently uh, decided not to do human rights for older people, but I think if we can redefine that debate to take age as a, a real criteria that is there within our human rights directives, that, then I think um, that would be important. And we also argue that we need a proactive policy approach uh, which raises public awareness. Uh, just in the way that we had to have gender awareness and, and race awareness, we really need in both our societies and across the globe an understanding of uh, raising awareness uh, of ageism. And then finally, and I just want to bring this up because this is quite a lot of work that we're doing uh, at, at Oxford. Um, the final one is design, um, because I think what we realize is that we as biologists or as social scientists can work uh, as hard as we like uh, to try and create um, a uh, inclusive living environments that suit uh, all um, ages uh, from a social point of view, but unless we have the physical environment right, uh, we will never succeed. So we had um, some uh, excellent, as they say, we, we had people from your ministry uh, uh, in um, Tel Aviv. We also had uh, some architects and we had um, uh, Jeremy Marson, uh, who is uh, really committed to inclusive design across the age course. Um, so the importance of design has to be recognized. And we believe it's products, services, plans, housing, communications. That is how we will achieve greater social equity uh, within uh, across social divisions, ethnic divisions, and for everyone. Uh, and in particular, the idea of this participatory design, co-design, and co-creation. Um, I hope that's just given you a very, very quick flavor uh, of what came out of our meeting. This declaration was very much based on the two wonderful days we had uh, in Jerusalem, plus uh, a variety of other meetings. And we really have to thank both Andrew Burns and Joel Cohen uh, and um, uh, the, the group um, uh, from the Israel point of view who really um, a chose aging as the 2019 um, uh, Anglo-Israeli symposium um, discussion but also have given us fantastic support. If you want to read about the declaration uh, that is the website where you can find it published in our new section uh, this morning um, and I hope it gives you just an idea uh, of how how well we really can integrate our understanding of aging, both at an individual level and at a societal level, uh, into the kind of research policy and practice that we do. Uh, thank you. Uh, thank you very much, uh, Sarah. It, uh, I, I must say we agree almost with all. I don't think there is a debate. Uh, we are very short in time, but still, uh, I was looking if somebody raised the hand and I didn't see uh, any. So if there is at least one uh, very important question because I think the next meeting we should open it and debate on all these very important uh, topics that you, ra you raised. Um, any questions? Um, can I ask a question? Yeah. Um, I'm just curious, what are some types of uh, age-related um, uh, Right, ageism. Uh, can you have some like concrete examples of something that would be considered ageism? Um, as somebody who's young, I think I have a hard time uh, relating. Yes. Um, so I, I'm afraid I, I didn't quite hear the question. It was a bit sort of crackly, but I think you were asking me to give concrete examples of ageism. Um, I think we have all been unbelievably shocked across the world of deaths in care homes. Uh, and it isn't just, I'll just give you the example from the UK. I do not know the Israel example, but what we have seen in the United Kingdom, we've also seen in Ireland and in some of the Scandinavian countries and some of the other European countries and in the US. Um, we were absolutely obsessed with hospitals. We forgot about care homes. Uh, and there's some really good research. We at Oxford have been doing some, but across the globe, people have been trying to understand why did we have such massive deaths in care homes? It wasn't just the age of the individuals, there was something else going on. And one of the things that was very clear was that um, those care homes that were not given protective equipment, that were not given priority with tests, where we have uh, care workers who have such low status in our society because they're caring for old people, that um, they tend to work for agencies, they are lowly paid, 
uh, they do not, um, they're not able actually to get the income they need by uh, just working in one care home. They were moving from care home to care home to community. And as I say, it isn't just in the UK, we saw it uh, in many places. Um, there was just a general disregard for older adults and their vulnerability. That is institutional ageism. But I don't think anyone would say they were being directly ageist. It's just that I think it's becoming very clear that very, very sadly, in many parts of the world, we value older people's lives less than we value younger people's lives. And I'm sure you're all aware of a variety of, um, not to specifically point fingers, but a variety of things that have been said by different governments, um, where there's been this inference that let it rip among older adults because we want to either shut them away so that um, if, you know, if you're over 50 or 60, you don't need to be out there socializing. So let's just lock you away. You just shield for the next year so that young people can get back to their lives and we can drive economies. And those actual words have been said by different individuals, both politicians, personalities, etc. That is institutional ageism. You would never say, let's lock all men away over 50 or let's lock all black people away. You just wouldn't do it. But you seem to think you can take a category of older adults and in some way see them as different. They don't seem to have the same needs that the rest of us have. That is an example of institutionalized ageism. But as I say, many of the people who say that would be horrified if they thought they were actually being ageist in that way. Thank you, Sarah, very much. And just one point from my side, what you said, uh, maybe if we'll do, uh, co really converge all data and combine and analyze, like today we understand across continent, across countries, and in these different cultures, maybe we will learn, you tell, uh, maybe we will learn more and maybe we will have, uh, you know, a better way to convince the public and the society and the government and so on. So thank you very much. Thank you. And now we are moving to the next uh, very great privilege of today. I want to invite Baroness Suzanne Greenfield uh, to, to give us, to provide the next uh, lecture. Um, uh, Baroness Suzanne Greenfield is a professor of pharmacology at Oxford University, same university. She is a neurologist, writer, and broadcaster. She has held a, reason, a research fellowship at the College of France, Paris, NYU, Medical Center, Melbourne University. She holds 32 honorary degrees from UK and foreign universities, has received numerous honors, um, including the Legion, uh, the honor from the, from the French government, an honorary fellowship from the Royal College of Physicians, the American Academy of uh, Achievement Golden Plate Award, and the Australian Medical Research Society uh, Medal. What else can you ask? She is also a fellow of the Royal Society in Edinburgh, and she is the founder and CEO of NeuroBioLetted. Oh, it will help many people. And uh, please, uh, Baroness Susan, in, I'm inviting you to start your talk. Okay. Good morning. Good morning. And you read it by your back of books. I will, I will translate it. Good morning. Anyway. Um, that's me showing off my Hebrew. There's one thing you didn't mention was my um, affection and my connections with Israel. And it's a great pleasure to be with you, however, virtually. Um, it's a shame uh, I can't be there, that lovely, lovely sunshine. So thank you very much for this invitation and the opportunity to share with you a little bit of what we're doing, which we believe is um, a completely different approach um, to that that's already been tried uh, for combating Alzheimer's disease. What I'd like to try and do is to persuade you in this short talk that Alzheimer's disease, more specific, more generally neurodegeneration, is actually an inappropriate form of development. And if that's the case, it opens up opportunities because once we understand the basic process of neurodegeneration, then we can target it and treat it much more effectively. So how do I, so I'm just going to, which one? Yeah, okay. Um, so there's various reasons why at the moment there's no effective treatment for Alzheimer's. And the first, I believe, is that one size doesn't fit all, as shown by these poor gentlemen who are, despite their sizes, 
um, wearing uh, different, uh, wearing the same size suit. Where's my print? Yeah. yeah. No, sorry. Oh, that one. Okay, sorry. Yeah. Okay, so the theories to date have mistakenly regarded brain cells as generic um, and approaches such as looking at inflammation or how neurons generally would respond to something, um, I don't think are going to actually help us very much because we now know that populations of brain cells have very different features. And we know that neurodegeneration is a highly selective process that's only apparent initially in certain cell groups. So if we understood more about the cells that were primarily vulnerable, then we could perhaps target them before people present with the cognitive decline of uh, confusion and memory issues. So we need a theory that explains what actually drives Alzheimer's disease. And the primarily vulnerable cells, interestingly enough, come from a different part of the embryo that you can actually uh, discern as early as 30 days gestation. So most brain cells come from what's called the ALAR plate as shown here. This is most brain cells. But what's really fascinating is the cells that are the first to be affected in neurodegeneration actually come from the basal plate. And what's even more, I think, enlightening is that a very big difference between these two groups of cells is that whilst most brain cells, as you can see, lose their sensitivity to developmental factors when they're mature, here in the basal plate, we know that they have retained their sensitivity to development. Now, surely you'd say that's a great thing if, if you're still able to grow, but not so fast, because we know that agents that can actually aid growth can, rather like the mythical Jackal and Hyde, can actually turn toxic. So here you can see with N-methyl diaspartate, which is a standard agent well known to neuroscientists for uh, causing calcium entry into cells, you can see here that if you look at the growth of cells, then it can change a lot according to the dose of NMDA. Indeed, at the beginning, you can see a nice enhanced neurite outgrowth, but as the dose is increased, as shown on the horizontal scale, you can see it's become toxic. Similarly, and most interestingly, with age, and this was actually done by an Israeli group, Emel and Shram, in the 90s, and what they showed was, that again with NMDA, that there was a change in tolerance to um, calcium admission um, with as little as seven days difference. So within seven days, you can see uh, there was a, a tolerance that's changed by a factor of three times um, to um, the amount of calcium going in. So we now know then that agents that can promote growth can actually turn into uh, Mr. Hyde. And uh, therefore one can imagine the following possibility. And this is our idea for driving the approach to neurodegeneration. These vulnerable cells, these hub of cells, as you can see here, are actually the ones that come from the basal plate. And one can imagine if they're damaged, either by something called free radicals or blow to the head or a toxin or local ischemia, anything, they will respond differently to all the other cells and that now they will mobilize the developmental mechanism that is still at their disposal, such that um, now the calcium going in, because it's a mature brain, will actually prove toxic. It will be um, not Dr. Jackal, but Mr. Hyde, because there's more calcium going in, um, perhaps the same amount as would be in development, but because they're mature cells, they will now actually be toxic. And this will carry on because the more cells that die, the more that mechanism will be mobilized. And then you'll have this feed forward or snowball effect that we call neurodegeneration. And that is our theory as to how neurodegeneration happens, that it's an inappropriate form of development. Now, what we need to know is what is driving, what molecule could be identified that causes the calcium to go in inappropriately? And that's what we've done. It's a molecule that we call T14, and you can see it here, stained rather faintly in the controls. But as one goes through the BRAC stages, these are the ages of severity for Alzheimer's disease, then you can see the dark blobs are becoming more prominent. So that's showing you that in the human brain, we're getting an increase in this evil chemical, T14, that perhaps normally has developmental functions, but is now driving in these specific cells the process of neurodegeneration. So this is T14. It's a peptide comprising 14 amino acids, hence the rather unoriginal name. You can see that what's very interesting, it has a homology with amyloid, which is the darling of many people working on um, Alzheimer's. But for us, 
its interest is the um, similarity in terms of the amino acids with the T14. It's derived from the cholinesterase C terminus. It has a partial homology, as you can see, with A beta. And we have shown that independently, it works independent of the enzyme, it has to be cleaved, and it enhances calcium currents. And in turn, we've been able to show it is trophic toxic. That is to say, it has an excitotoxic action that is dependent not just on the dose or the duration of application, but actually on the age of the cells where it's happening. So this is a proof of concept with the jackal and hide, whereas you can see here in the rat brain, the T14, as the animal is maturing, as it's growing, so the T14 levels are falling. But that high developmental level is recapitulated in the human brain tissue in Alzheimer's. So we are saying that this then is proof that neurodegeneration could be an inappropriate reactivation of development and it starts deep in the brain in those hub cells that come from the basal plate. Second reason why there's no effective treatment for Alzheimer's is a valuable time window is lost. We know that some 10 or 20 years occurs, must pass, while the neurodegeneration is carrying on with that snowball effect before someone presents with memory problems. And the reason for that, my own view, is that it's because it's deep down in the brain in these very primitive cells with a high degree of redundancy and compensation for each other. It's only when it spreads to the so-called higher parts of the brain that you'll actually see the cognitive decline. So we're closing the door after the horse has bolted if you only treat someone once they appear in the clinic with a memory problem. What we really need to do is to somehow, independent of cognitive symptoms, detect that the problem is underway, most obviously with a routine blood test. And that's what we're trying to do. Now, cholinesterase, the molecule um, from which the peptide is cleaved, normally occurs as four so-called catalytic subunits. Just think of it as four units called G4. And they're bound together um, by disulfide bonds, as shown by these two S's, which contain our peptide. Now, what's really interesting is that sometimes, in certain circumstances, we see it as a monomer, G1, and that is because these bonds have been cleaved so that our free T14 is available. So whenever you see G1, you know that the peptide has been cleaved to go off and do its job. Now, what's really interesting is that in the developing brain, and this is other people's work, as you can see, there is a disproportionate ratio of that form of the cholinesterase that then declines into maturity. That is recapitulated in Alzheimer brain and indeed in blood. So it seems that this is indirect evidence that the peptide T14 has indeed been cleaved and it's there at work in the developing brain doing its normal job, but it's now been unleashed inappropriately in the Alzheimer brain. And that too is reflected in the blood. So this will then leave it as a, as a possible candidate for a biomarker and you can see here that we have shown the T14 mirrors this indeed in the developing um, rodent brain. It's high at, um, at seven days and then it starts to decline. It's high in the human brain and therefore it, the prospects of measuring it in human blood uh, should be very promising and potential. And that's what we're doing at the moment with various types of antibody, with mass spectrometry, uh, which um, gives a very clear readout but is not very quantitative. But more recently we are partnering uh, with a company called ILOF, based in Portugal, that actually uses a machine learning optics approach. More of that uh, if we have time in the questions. The third reason there's uh, no effective treatment for Alzheimer's is there's no authentic animal model, as you can see here from some recent um, uh, uh, correspondence in the, in the scientific journals. Um, so what we have tried to do, therefore, is have the first non-transgenic animal model, which could actually reproduce authentically the full profile and we've shown that with a single injection of the peptide into the rodent brain, we can elevate tau in three weeks. Uh, there is significant brain cell loss after 16 weeks and at 24 weeks impairment in the water maze. So this is just an early example of how perhaps we could really reproduce the mechanism of Alzheimer's disease that has eluded others trying to develop animal models because uh, they didn't have the full narrative, whereas if this really is the narrative, then perhaps we could reproduce that. The fourth reason uh, there's no effective treatment for Alzheimer's is that um, many uh, drugs have tried to target amyloid, and they've continued to do this. It's uh, attracted 80% of the funding, but as you may be aware, there's no effective treatment as yet for um, the therapy for Alzheimer's. And my own suggestion is that whilst amyloid might be important, it's a downstream effect 
of an initial process that's been triggered by T14. You can see here, for example, that it can occur in normal brains. So the amyloid hypothesis doesn't account for the selective vulnerability, nor indeed clinical features, such as the frequent occurrence of Parkinson's disease. So that's why we need to look at the real mechanism. And what we have designed is an agent that blocks the T14, namely T14 itself, but bent into a circle. And this is why we think it's um, more effective at the so-called receptor of the target, because other agents that have tried to target that receptor um, have met with limited success, because we would argue the peptide is already there and it won't be dislodged very easily. So this is fighting like with like, and actually having a um, inactivated form of the evil, com evil chemical uh, to do the job. So this is um, so-called MBP14, and we've shown it's 50 times higher affinity for binding than the licensed drug galanthamine, and it's indeed 100 times more potent in its effect. So this is our um, lead drug that we are now working with. And uh, more recently, we've shown that um, if you apply it intranasally, it can actually access the brain. And acutely, when it does that, it does indeed displace the T14 for a significant period of time. We've now been working with a company called Evotech um, in transgenic animal models to see if it's effective. And so far, we've found that 20% can get into the brain compared to 1% of the current lead compound. It has a protective effect on weight, as you can see here, a trend. Um, moreover, it's protective on memory, comparable, it seems, to the wild type, and it has a protective effect against amyloid accumulation in the brain. So um, in summary, our vision for treating Alzheimer's disease is twofold. First, you'd have a biomarker that could actually detect the symptoms before they appear. So you could go to the doctor and they say, well, I'm afraid there's good news and bad news. The bad news is that you have an aberrant marker. Um, but the good news is that now we can actually give you a medication that actually stops any more cells dying, a nasal spray. And even though you have no symptoms, take that drug now. And if you take that drug now, daily, um, then you'll have never the symptoms coming on. And that would be a relatively low cost, ethically compliant um, way of treating Alzheimer's. So although it's not a cure, it would actually be contained and it would actually enable people to live um, a much more fulfilling life and for the carers to not be carers, but to be lifelong companions for a healthy old age. Toda Rabat. Uh, uh, <laughs> I would love to, to go on in Hebrew. Uh, thank you very much. Uh, mm -hmm. And I'm sure there are many questions. So, but, but I was looking now, I was running to see if there is hands. So I suggest that somebody just uh, click on his, uh, uh, his speaker if somebody has a question. Yes. Okay. Hey, man, can I start? Okay. Uh, beautiful, uh, beautiful talk and very interesting, Susan. I, I wonder if we know anything about the mechanism of cleavage for, the, for uh, getting this yes. better, and can we um, uh, inhibit this? Uh... Yes, we do. Yeah. Yes, thank you for that. Um, there's, to my own view, not just a single enzyme that would cleave it. Um, I can't really reveal the uh, enzyme that we've... This is the disadvantage, I'm afraid, of being um, in a company, and I can't say too much, but I can say we have identified at least one enzyme that can cleave... Um, the peptide from the cholinesterase, but there are others. For example, um, insulin degrading enzyme has already been highlighted as another possible um, enzyme that could work in that way. I think what is very interesting is one can imagine that in the mature situation, the cholinesterase is in the membrane. And if you then have anything that happens that destabilizes that membrane, you'll have the cholinesterase um, vulnerable in the extracellular space. So it would be subject perhaps to more than one protease. And that might be different from the development situation where it doesn't have to reside on the membrane, but there is a secretion process direct from the smooth endoplasmic reticulum into the space. Um, someone who's a great expert on that, and I don't know if she's here, is Mona Sarek at the Hebrew University, who's yeah. a very dear friend and colleague. So I don't know if she's there, but she would, I'm sure, have lots of thoughts about that as well. Oh, I, I have a question. May I? Uh, yes, Ilana. Oh, okay. Great talk. Thank really you. Lovely. Thank, Thank you, you. Mira. And uh, I was wondering, as you said that it's connected to the development. Do we know of diseases, uh, developmental diseases that associate uh, the, the, the peptide or the protein? Sorry, can you say again? It's about do, the other do diseases. Do we know of specific uh, developmental diseases? Well, yes, sure. Um, I don't know about developmental diseases, but what we do know um, is certainly 
Um, motor neuron disease and Parkinson's disease can often be correlated with these. And what I imagine happens is that you will have damage, let's say to an area such as the locus ceruleus, which will primarily cause um, issues eventually related to cognition. But if the damage is extensive, it will spread to the substantia nigra, and that's why you have the Parkinson's. Yeah. So this is why I favor looking at cell populations rather than single cell mechanisms, because if you look at cell populations, they do have different features. And if it was the case, it was a generic feature of brain cells to degenerate, then every time you'd have a stroke anywhere in the brain, you'd, then you will trigger, and that doesn't happen. And I think people really need to address more a little bit the neuroscience of the different populations of brain cells. Thank you. Thank you. There, is, there is another question from Waltman. Yeah. Uh, what is the uh, relationship between uh, the degeneration of T14 and uh, apolipoprotein E type or isoforms? Okay, I would suggest that it would be a more downstream event because the T14 um, isn't related to cell metabolism and it is selective to certain cells. So um, what I would suggest is that that is the initial cause, if you like, of the disruption. And then um, those other... Uh, pathological features will ensue as downstream effects from it. So uh, APOE is downstream of T14? I would say that, yes. Okay. Yes. Eld, um, do you have another very short question? Because we have to move on. Yeah, uh, very quickly. I just wonder, uh, can you comment about the um, idea that Alzheimer's is not a single disease, but actually a collection of maladies that eventually lead to dementia? And Sure. One, one example is this, the, the major difference between the uh, effect of the mutations in presumin in one, some of them render gamma secretase mm -hmm. inactive, yeah. some of them activate it. Sure. Um, okay, so what I'd say now might sound a little bit heretical because I'd rather go the other way. And rather than subdivide Alzheimer's disease into um, different conditions according perhaps to the, um, the different uh, molecular events that are occurring possibly, I would rather say that the issue is more neurodegeneration, which I would widen out to include Parkinson's and motor neurons and, and so on, because the heart of the problem is why is it these brain cells are doing, which is in a sense against biology. In biology, we're familiar with homeostasis and things being returned to normal. And this is bucking the trend. This is a feed forward effect. And for me, that is a more helpful um, process to sort of look at rather than worry about differentiating subtypes. I would rather think generally about what Parkinson's disease say um, and Alzheimer's disease have in common rather than what makes different types of Alzheimer's different. And I think looking at the actual mechanism um, might yield more, might, yeah, might yield more. But obviously it depends on your own discipline and you know, what kind of um, things you find um, perhaps the most obvious. And that's why science is so interesting. It's because we all pursue different routes. But for me personally, it's the fascination of the neurodegenerative process, which incidentally, just to make everyone completely, <laughs> be completely heretical, one could extend to non-neural tissue such as cancer, because if you say it's an inappropriate form of development, that is indeed what cancer is. And we've actually published in 2017 in OncoTarget, uh, my colleague Sarah Graciaretis and I, an editorial on Alzheimer's and cancer, two sides of the same coin, which you know, is on our website and you can see it. <laughs> so thank you. So, Susan, toda raba. Toda raba. And thank you all. Uh, I hope we could meet afterwards and everybody will approach you and ask some questions. I yeah. hope we'll do it soon. Uh, but we have now to move to another university. Um, the next, our next speaker is Tarani Kendola. Do I pronounce it right? Tell me. <laughs> Before I'm going on, uh, uh, from the University of uh, uh, Rochester, a professor of medical sociology. Uh, he is currently co-director of the National Center of Research and International uh, Center for Life Course Studies in Society and Health. What else do we need? He also, he also co-directs uh, uh, the Sociobiological Center and Biosocial Research. He is a, a fellow of the Academy of Social Sciences and is a member of the Economic and Social Research Council's Strategic Advisory Network. Um, then what I'm saying, we should go to the broadband of healthy aging and, and look at all those things. 
and his research expertise spans different disciplines, population and public health and epidemiology, social statistics and sociology, and different uh, methodological approach, and they're what we need right now to look at the broad picture, please. Well, uh, thank you very much for inviting me to this, uh, to this conference. I'm very excited by it. Hopefully you can all hear me. Um, I'm in my uh, room, in bedroom in, <laughs> in Manchester. It's, it's, uh, it's sunny in Manchester today. I, I wanted to turn my screen around so that you can see, see for yourself. I don't know if you can see. Well, no, you can't really see. Apologies for that. That experiment didn't really work, but um, it's, uh, you know, Manchester has a reputation for being uh, not particularly sunny, but today is, it's, it's really lovely. So I'm going to share my slides now. So uh, let's see. Yeah, so um, hopefully you can see the slides. Um, yeah, uh, thank you for, 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 for describing my background. I'm, I'm a medical sociologist based at the University of Manchester. Um, I'm also currently the, the deputy director of our Aging Research Institute, uh, MICRA, based here in Manchester. Um, Sarah started uh, today's conference with uh, a reminder of the Healthy Aging Grand Challenge in the UK. So. Uh, that's the, you know, one of the strap lines is that uh, the aims is that to ensure people enjoy at least five extra healthy independent years of life by 2035, while also narrowing the gap between the experiences of the richest and the poorest. And this gives you some idea about the, the scale of the gap, at least geographically. So uh, we've got uh, men and women from the richest and the poorest parts of the UK. And in terms of disability-free life expectancy, you can see that the gap is around um, about four to five years for men. So men in Kensington and Chelsea um, have, uh, can expect to live an extra 12 years disability-free uh, from the age of 65. And for people like me living in Manchester, that's only 7.6 years. So if we are able to re uh, so reduce this gap by five years so as per the the, 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 the challenge, that would be, uh, that would be quite remarkable. Um, and it would enable me to, to have um, a few extra years of disability-free life, life expectancy by the time I retire. Uh, we see a similar gap for women, um, but it's uh, perhaps not quite, as, um, not quite as large as the gap is for men. Um, another pattern that you observe here is that all of these, most of these rich air areas tend to be in the south, southern bits of, of England and most of the uh, sort of the deprived um, areas where you have uh, lower levels of life expectancy and lower levels of disability free life expectancy tend to be in the northern regions of, of England. Now in terms of what are the drivers for these uh, uh, differences in life expectancy and disability free life expectancy uh, you know, there, there are well observed um, sort of correlations between wealth and chronic uh, diseases, chronic conditions like uh, chronic heart disease, where the differences between the wealthiest and poorest uh, groups in, in, in England are at least three times for in terms of chronic heart disease, uh, two times for diabetes, and at least two times for arthritis. Um, and then when we turn into sort of uh, types of explanations for why there are these differences between richer and poorer people. Uh, we see smoking is, is, a, is, a key, um, is a key reason here. So the difference in, in the prevalence of uh, current smoking for men, it's, uh, it's more than five times for men and about four times for women. That's the difference between the wealthiest and poorest groups uh, for men and women. Um, and similarly, when we look at physical uh, the differences between the wealthiest and poorest men, uh, it's about six times and um, similarly a similar a difference for, for, for women as well. So behavioral explanations for why there are these inequalities in healthy aging, um, they're very important, but I, I want to turn um, my, our attention to perhaps other explanations and I'm going to look at, at stress, but also looking at a period in, in the life course that is perhaps a little bit earlier than the age of 50. Uh, so some years ago now, uh, you know, we published this, this paper that looked at the differences in mortality between the northern and southern regions of England. 
So as I described before, people in the north tend to have lower levels of life expectancy. And this um, sort of summarizes the excess northern mortality uh, uh, between the periods of 1965 to 2015 for different age groups. And you know, we see a consistent pattern that um, you know, there's, there's excess northern mortality uh, no matter you know, what period it is and no matter what age group. But really, the age group where this excess northern mortality is really hitting is not at the oldest age groups, but at, say, midlife from age 35 onwards to about age 50. So trying to understand what is it about uh, this period of mid midlife that is resulting in such uh, marked inequalities between the, the, the more deprived northern areas and the rich and southern areas is a very important um, process for, of understanding how to reduce these inequalities in healthy aging. So, um, of course, you'll notice that you know, midlife is the time when most people are in work. So I'm, I'm very interested in the role of working conditions um, in, in trying to understand why there are these social inequalities in healthy aging. Um, this is a study uh, that was conducted on gas and electricity workers in France. Um, so they, it, the Gazelle study was, uh, you know, at that time, the, the retirement age was uh, 55. Um, it, it was a very interesting study because they measured the, the work and health conditions of the gas and electricity workers, these are men, uh, at every year, and they could follow them up uh, as they approach retirement, so that's zero, age zero, and after retirement, about seven years after retirement. So the, the men in, denoted in red were the men in sort of very low quality jobs. So they, had, uh, in the, they were the lowest occupational grade and then they had high levels of work stress. And you can see that in terms of the prevalence of poor self-rated health, as they approached their retirement age, so as they approach zero here, their levels of poor self-rated health really shot up. And then up, upon retirement, their levels of poor self-rated health declined. So they appear to be getting healthier um, during retirement. And after retirement for about seven years, it was pretty much level. Uh, in contrast, the people, the men who were employed in good work, so these were employed in the highest occupational grades and they had low levels of work stress, there was really no difference in their levels of poor self-rated health before and after retirement. So this kind of evidence was, was telling us that there's something about the role of the working conditions of, of workers that could be driving their, 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 their health responses. Um, so I, I did something similar in, um, so in, in, in another study that got published a few years ago where I looked at the occupational or social differences in uh, social class differences in physical and mental health as people um, aged from between 50 to 74 years old. Uh, this is the, based on a civil servants cohort uh, in, in London called the Whitehall 2 study. And here we see that uh, there is a difference between the, those in the highest occupational civil service grades and those in the lowest occupational grades. So that those in the highest occupational grades had better health compared to those in the lowest grades but what's more interesting is that as they became older, uh, as we followed these people up, uh, the differences became even larger so that the highest occupational grades, they, everybody's physical health tends to decline as they become older, but the rate of decline for those in the highest occupational grades was much uh, less slow compared to steeper declines for the lower, so lower occupational grades. We see a uh, sort of a slightly reverse pattern for mental health because mental health tends to improve over time, but a similar pattern of widening occupational class differences in mental health as people, as, as the civil servants get older. So I'm particularly interested in the role of, 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 of work, work stress in particular, but whenever people uh, look at the role of work stress and they, you type in uh, work stress into Google images, you get, this is the first picture that you get. This is the kind of picture that you get. The, the, uh, sort of a, a management type person uh, who is really stressed out. But I mean, to what extent is this really true? I mean, if we, if we try to look at um, sort of more biological stress processes, actually it's not those at the top of the management ladder that have 
the most, the highest levels of stress, but it's actually those at, at the bottom of the management of, of the occupational class schema that have the highest levels of biomarkers related to stress. So for this, uh, I, I come back to this Whitehall II uh, civil servant study. Uh, it was started by uh, Professor Sir Michael Marmot back in uh, 1985. So it was originally a cohort of about 10,300 civil servants. Um, and every two or three years, there's a questionnaire and then a clinical screening process that, uh, that, go, that goes on. Um, what's more interesting is that uh, in, in, in some of the waves, there were sort of uh, salivary cortisol measures that were, that were measured. So we could see um, it's sort of natural experiment um, as the civil servants retired, you know, you can see over here there the percentage of in the cohort who who were over 60 years old increased over time, you know, as they became older. Um, and 60 years was the retirement age. We could observe what was happening to their levels of of cortisol, salivary cortisol, as they retired. So, um, you know, quick summary of of of, of this work. Uh, the line denoted by blue are those in the highest occupational grades in the civil service, and the line denoted by uh, the brown are those in the lowest occupational grade. So it it seems to be indicating that there's some differences between the diurnal pattern in cortisol. So um, as 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 um, as as we go through the day, uh, our cortisol levels are at the highest in the morning, and then they decline back to to almost uh, you know, negligible levels uh, by the time it's bedtime. But uh, so so a steeper decline in our cortisol levels is an indication of of a better uh, sort of stress response. And uh, a shallower decline over the day is an indication of, of you know, not, not, not such a great stress response. You know, more stress hormones circulating in our, in our system by the time we go to bed. So that's not particularly helping. Um, so this was, this was suggesting there was some difference, but not much difference um, between the high, highest and lowest grades employees while they were just about approaching retirement age. So on average, they were about 59 years old. Uh, when we took the snapshot of their diurnal profiles and cortisol. And this was, their, was the picture of the same employees uh, about two years later, so two to three years later, so they were about 61 years old. And here we see a much clearer dim, uh, difference between the highest and low grades. So the, the high grades are in blue, have a much steeper decline in their cortisol levels compared to the, to, to the low grades. So, uh, there's there's something about the stress response of the high grade employees while they're still in work. They 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 might be a little bit uh, stressed perhaps by their um, by by their work duties, but it's not long lasting. It doesn't last beyond uh, beyond retirement because after retirement we see a much stronger pattern in the social differences and the response to uh, to to stressors. So it's those in the lowest occupational grades, the the lower social classes, that have a, a, a more sort of stress in their lives, as indicated by a, a flatter a flatter diurnal profile in their in in their cortisol profiles. So just to summarize, um, you know what what I found is that there are higher levels of stress in more disadvantaged uh, social groups, especially occupational social groups, um, even in work and, and as people enter retirement. Um, and this might be one of the reasons for why, uh, why we're finding that even in early old age, um, so around the period of 60, 65 to 70, there is uh, an increasing pattern of, of social inequalities in both stress and health in early old age. So. Uh, it's just as important to address the social determinants of stress. What is it that is causing uh, low grade, low disadvantaged groups to be, have higher levels of stress responses? Uh, that could be just as important as addressing uh, smoking and physical activity in, in later life. So um, thank you very much for listening. Thank you. Uh, thank you very much. Um, and uh, thank you for keeping the time also. I'm very stressed about that, thanks a lot. <laughs> uh, uh, but, but it's really very interesting. And, and uh, I, I will say I was looking um, regarding hands raising and I didn't see any yet. Uh, but in that case, I just uh, wanted to, to reflect from my point of view uh, to what you said, uh, even at the, the very last slide, 
on, on the prediction on, and on the, the parameters and so on. But the question is, could we go, um, you did it in, um, in one uh, cohort, could we go across different culture and so on and have a, a much bigger span of parameters and then maybe reveal some underlying clusters which will be different either for physical or cultural or other uh, issues. I'm sorry, my, my internet gave up in the middle of your question, so, so I'm, I'm afraid. Um, uh, so I think your question was, you know, I observed this for a certain population, but is this, is this, is this really true? In, in a very broad band uh, of parameters, a very yes. broad span of parameters that yes. you will look at, you know, yes. regarding stress and so on, yes. which, could, which could come even from physical or mental environment. Yeah. Um, so, so yes. Yeah, so, firstly, you know, this um, this sort of finding that sort of the more disadvantaged uh, groups experience more stress, uh, at least in terms of the biomarkers associated with stress, like cortisol, is something that's been replicated again and again. Um, but uh, you're right. So, in terms, what I tend to be looking at uh, is is in terms of working life and and work related stressors. So that's 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 entirely true. When we look at this uh, in relation to other other kinds of stressors. Uh, early life is one that has had the most uh, amount of, of work that's published. So early life adversities and um, biomarkers of stress, um, there been, there's been a lot of strong correlations been observed for that. And uh, the other one, uh, life stressor that's particularly important is financial stressors. So, um, so f financial stressors and cortisol, that, that too has been, um, has been particularly, uh, that association has been observed in different populations and different cultures as well. Thank you. So money makes it all? M money's, money is, is, is quite important, yes. I, I wouldn't say it's, it's, it's the sole thing, but uh, the, the other one that's really important are relationships. So social relationships and the quality of social relationships, that's, uh, that seems to have quite a strong um, effect on, on sort of biomarkers of stress. So it's not all down to money, but social relationships as well. So, so you, you think that uh, environment, even physical environment doesn't, uh, or, or or you know, uh, religious or culture? Um, so definitely, yes, a physical environment uh, has, has a role to play as well. I think, um, you know, so, so uh, you know, pollution, you know, that, that, would, that would definitely have, have a role to play in, um, you know, affecting people's uh, cortisol levels, for example. But I, I guess I'm, 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 I'm sort of putting out there the importance of, of the social environment as well, which is uh, just as, I, I think, just as important as the physical environment. So thank you very much. Uh, is there any question be be before we, we move to the last lecture? Yeah, yeah. can I ask okay. a question? I sure. tried to raise my hand, but it didn't work, I think. Uh, so thank you for the talk, it was very interesting. I wonder if you have seen any differences in the stress response between men and women, and also if, uh, if there are any sex differences in the effect of retirement uh, in the variables that you uh, studied. Thank you. Yes, thank you. So um, originally, I, th I think there were quite a lot of people that thought that uh, work had a, you know, in terms of work-related stress that tends to have a stronger association with poorer health among men because work seems to be more, more, more important for the, the, the identity of men compared to women. But I think in, in more recent years, people have been showing that as, 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 as work becomes more central to women's identity, that's that's no longer the case. So um, so actually, I, I think um, in terms of you know sex differences in in the effect of life stressors, uh, we see we you know at least in, in in relation to work, we don't see that strong a difference. Where where I think there is a, uh, some evidence of a difference is in relation to family stressors. So the role of childcare. And and um, in particular, you know, and there, of course, women still have 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 a much greater um, role and identity compared to men, and I think we also see that uh, disproportionately affecting their biomarkers of stress. 
Um, in relation to the retirement differences between women, men and women, I, I, I myself, I, ha I haven't looked, I haven't sort of uh, seen any evidence of strong differences in the, in the differential sort of gender effect of retirement on, on men's, men and women's health. Thank you. So thank you very much. I just want to mention that Sylvia is our new director of the Herzog Center for Aging in Tel Aviv University. Uh, thank you and good luck. And yes. uh, now we are moving to the last uh, speaker, Eli Kesher. And it's a pleasure to be back. I would like to acknowledge, I saw that um, Sammy Sago is in the audience. I didn't actually see him, but I saw his name. So I wanna give a shout out to Sammy, who has been such an incredible supporter um, to Tel Aviv University, to all of Israel and beyond. Um, knows a lot of science, an incredible amount, and is really engaged in neuroscience, research on aging, and of course, so much more. So it's a pleasure to invite you all back to the second session of the Birax UK Israel virtual conference on healthy aging. It's the last session of the day, but I hope very much that we're gonna see you all in person in June. So I would like to introduce now the chair and Dr. Itamar Harel is at the Hebrew University of Jerusalem. And because he's not speaking at this conference, but he'll be speaking in June, I'll give you a little bit of a hint that he's developed a genetic platform for studying aging using the shortest living uh, lived vertebrate model. It's the African turquoise killifish. And I encourage you to look at his website, uh, really fantastic uh, organism to work with. He's um, had Damon Runyon, Human Frontier Science Foundation and Rothschild Fellowships. He's also highly involved in science education via both academic and popular lectures. You can see some of that on his website as well. He writes popular science. He leads training courses and scientific conferences. And because of this work, he's been recognized by several organizations, including the Ilan Ramon Award for Outstanding Academic Achievements, the Israeli American Council Award of Excellence and Community Leadership, and most recently, elected to the Zuckerman STEM Leadership Program. So congratulations, Itamar, that's really wonderful. And you've only started your lab a few years ago. So without further ado, Itamar, I'll hand over the chair and you can introduce our speakers. Thank you so much. Uh, can you hear me okay? Yeah, I'm just going to uh, mute everyone so that we can get everyone muted. And then if you're speaking, you unmute yourself. And I want to remind you that to ask questions, you should raise your hand on the participant list. So thank you very much, uh, Karen, for the introduction and for the opportunity to be a uh, chair uh, at the meeting. Can you unmute me for a second, Karen? I, I did it, okay. Um, so the first speaker uh, of the session is uh, Anne uh, Schilder. Dr. Schilder is a uh, base at University College uh, London's Ear Institute and practices a pediatric ENT at the Royal National Throat, Nose and Ear Hospital. Uh, she is a uh, joint coordinating editor of uh, Cochrane ENT and national lead of the NIHR Clinical Research Network ENT Speciality. As director of the Evident and the NIHR UCLH uh, Biomedical Research Center Deafness and Hearing Problems team, she leads a program of translational uh, research. Um, so thank you uh, for, for presenting your work and uh, for being the first speaker of the session. Just reminding everyone to try to keep uh, time. Our slots are 15 minute talk and uh, five minutes questions. Well, thank you very much. Thank you very much for um, inviting me. I'm delighted to talk at this conference. And of course, I would have loved to be in Israel. I've got many friends in Israel and I can't wait to come back and, and see them all uh, again. And um, 
I've learned a lot from um, the talks today and, and I hope um, this talk will sort of open some eyes about opportunities we have to bring the aging and dementia and hearing field um, together. So why, why do we talk uh, about hearing loss in the context of, of healthy aging? Um, this is a figure from uh, the recent Lancet uh, Commission report on dementia. And um, I think you've all um, seen it before. Um, the figure is based uh, on an extensive literature review on risk factors that are either modifiable or non-modifiable for dementia. And what it shows is that if we could and would modify hearing loss acquired in midlife, we could potentially reduce the risk of dementia by 8%. And this information has been quite new when it was first presented uh, a few years ago in the first Lancet Commission report. And it has really sparked interest for many researchers, clinicians, and also um, from industry and investors to look at new approaches for hearing loss. Of course, this, this paper has also uh, raised a lot of discussions, uh, in particular about um, the nature of the association between hearing loss and dementia. Um, and I would recommend to look at this recent paper from Neuron, um, where um, they looked at, at the causative pathways or potential causative pathways between hearing loss and dementia. Because of course, it's the question, is it, is it a common etiology? Are we talking about uh, dementia being the effect of hearing loss due to a lack of sensory input? Or is, um, is there an interaction uh, between the two? But assuming that modifying hearing loss reduces our risk of dementia, then what can we do about this potentially? And I think the first thing we could do is providing hearing care. And that's what we've been focusing for the past decades, I think. Um, that could involve, for example, hearing screening in adults, and this is a discussion I think that's being held in, in many countries across the world. So far, it hasn't been implemented yet because there's insufficient evidence to show that it works. So I think there is a, you know, an opportunity to do research in that domain. Traditionally, we provide hearing devices to people with uh, an aidable hearing loss. And um, that means that there are opportunities to do research um, in that domain. We know that um, about 30% of hearing aids um, are being underused and an additional 20% of hearing aids don't get used at all. So what we are currently doing in the UK is preparing for a trial where adults who are offered a hearing aid are followed up and monitored um, more uh, systematically and, and see if that improves their hearing aid uptake and, and, and cognitive health. Of course, we need to look at innovative ways of, of hearing testing and potentially innovative ways of providing hearing aids. Again, there's a lot going on internationally around this and we are developing, uh, as we speak, uh, a program of work around that. Um, and I think in this context, important activities are the ACHIEVE trial in the US. I think it's, it's complete recruitment where um, a big trial led by Frank Lynn, where uh, people, older people um, are, have their hearing screened and uh, receive either uh, hearing aids or uh, the sort of current pathway where there is a less proactive approach to hearing loss. And we do um, a similar trial with the same protocol. We work with Frank in the UK, where we uh, work with people who are diagnosed with uh, mild uh, cognitive impairment, who visit community health clinic, and we randomize to a proactive hearing program versus care as usual. But what is also, and I think this is, this is the most exciting element, but that's going on in our field, can we actually cure hearing loss? Um, and what we have seen in the past decade is that we've had major, we've made major progress in understanding the mechanisms that underlie hearing loss. And this has allowed the field to identify 
new therapeutic targets and develop new approaches to hearing loss, meaning drugs, genes, and cell therapeutics. And these therapeutics aim to provide targeted treatments to protect, repair, and restore hearing. And as a field, um, I, I couldn't believe this five years ago, but we are really moving towards precision medicine for hearing loss. Um, this field is, is very much driven by biotech and pharma companies, and many of those are spin-outs from university groups. And this field is at the moment very well supported by large investments for private and public funds. And early 2019, we published an overview of the companies that were active in this field and their therapeutic approaches. And at the time, there were about 40. We've recently, uh, about a year later, um, done a similar scoping review, and we found that by now, there are more than 90 of those com companies that are competing uh, to be the first to deliver an effective novel therapy for hearing loss. Um, it, I would recommend you to, to have a look at the table. It's, it's, uh, you can find it on the website of the Charity Action uh, on Hearing Loss it, it, with the link that we provide here. In the table, you will see um, the various therapeutic approaches, uh, therapeutic modalities, lead indication, and you will see that it is more or less um, all over the place. And that, really highlights the biggest challenge that we have in the field. Um, sensory neural hearing loss, it's not, a it's not a disease, it's not a condition, but it's a symptom of a wide range of underlying pathologies. I think very similar to the talk we heard this morning about um, dementia. And although there are some common pathways and mechanisms that will allow us to take a more generic approach to the treatment of hearing loss, there will be no size that fits all. I would like to give a brief example of a trial um, that um, we've run in this, in this field. And this is a, a trial um, of a gamma secretase inhibitor, which is a small molecule pharmaceutical drug. Very familiar, I think, to those working in the dementia field because it was originally developed and tested for Alzheimer's disease. This drug has been repurposed for topical use in sensory neural hearing loss. And the discovery was made in the lab by, uh, from Albert Edge, where they found that in adult mice that were deafened by noise, uh, a local application of a gamma sec secretase inheritor um, promoted the supporting cells in the inner ear to transdifferentiate into hair cells. And this was followed in these mice by partial recovery of their hearing. So what we did is we, we took this discovery um, from the lab into the clinic and we did that by bringing together um, uh, a European consortium and by applying for EU Horizon 2020 funding. Um, we um, found in our phase one trial that the approach is safe. So we, we inject the, the drug um, in one ear, uh, three times with one week intervals. And uh, we found that that approach is safe. We are uh, currently completing the last 12 month follow-ups and hope to report on the trial soon. And what we saw is the incredible interest of both the media as well as patients from across the world who, who really wanted to take part in that trial. And I think um, this, this meeting, but also the developments that I've just shown, um, show that we, there are real opportunities and avenues um, for us as, as researchers and clinicians working in these fields. Um, because although the Lancet has highlighted for a few years the, the association between the two, we haven't really brought the fields um, as effectively together as, as I think we could. And this would involve in um, developing a joint patient pathway for clinical services, developing guidance, guidance on who and how to test. For us as hearing researchers, it is obvious that we uh, would uh, require hearing screening in dementia services. And I think for those 
uh, working um, in, in dementia, they would feel that, of course, when you provide hearing service, you need to see whether people show the early signs of dementia. And I think what is important that we need to agree with the fields on minimum data sets. Um, clinical trials, I think it's important seeing the association between the two conditions that when we are working on cognition trials, it would be important to test hearing loss as a potential effect modifier and vice versa. And there is a lot of work to be done around biomarkers that may be shared across dementia and hearing loss, and as well as looking at repurposing drugs. Um, we, there's a lot of unknowns about hearing loss, about uh, deep uh, pheno and genotyping. So there's a need uh, for further cohort studies and, and looking at large clinical population that capture both hearing loss and cognition data. Um, we recently catalogued those papers. We, it's, it's about to be published, but we found a, 188 international hearing data sets, 25 of which also uh, looked at hearing, uh, looked at cognition. So I think there is work to be done uh, in that domain. And as I said, it's important to look at biomarkers um, as predictors of hearing loss and cognitive decline. We're all aware that there are efforts like the uh, Alzheimer's Disease Neuroimaging Initiative, the UK Biobank, but I think we, we should be looking at, at more. And that is going to require funding. And that means that I think as a field, we need to continue to work uh, to influence policy and funding. Um, Karen and I are, are currently uh, both involved in the, in the Lancet Commission on Global Hearing Loss. And we will um, definitely form bridges with uh, the Lancet Commission to, to highlight the importance of uh, uh, the association between the two. And together we work with um, the World Health Organization as well to raise the profile of hearing loss. And um, that is what I would like to share with you today. So um, I'm really keen to, to answer your questions. Thank you very much for a fantastic talk. And I'm gonna ask the first question, if I may. Um, so do you see if you, if you split your uh, if you, if you, patients with hearing loss uh, to congenital people that have lost their hearing from a disease or people that naturally uh, lost their hearing uh, due to age-related circumstances that might actually be affected by something related to uh, uh, their nervous system. Do you see anything that can uh, predict dementia with the same confidence or it's only specific to a certain group? Well, I think we don't know yet um, because we don't have, have those data. I think people have focused on age-related hearing loss uh, mostly and, and looking at, at the association in, in large cohorts mm -hmm. um, because age-related hearing loss, of course, because it's so common. We know that that 60% of people over 60 and 70% of people over 70 have an aidable hearing loss. Um, and, and it's a good question and that, that has been asked before, but I don't think we've looked at it enough, whether, whether early hearing loss also um, puts people at risk for developing dementia. Okay, and a, and a, f a short follow-up, uh, is it known if a uh, specific sensory uh, deprivation of other kinds also leads to these types of, of dementia? Well, I think, I think that's what we see in, in, in vision loss, isn't it? Uh, definitely. Um, so I think it, it's a principle if we, if, we, if we don't use our senses and we don't use our brain to process that, the input from our senses that, 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 that may contribute to, to, um, to dementia. Okay. It was actually a very nice uh, study showing that uh, scientists in Anta Antarctica which they don't have enough stimuli because everything is white. Actually, their size of the brain diminishes with time. Uh, so we have quite a bit of time. We have uh, a few minutes. And uh, if there's anyone that wants to ask, I see that uh, Rita Roth wants to uh, ask. So feel free to uh, uh, press your space bar and ask your question. Hi, thank you. Thank you for the lovely talk. Uh, just wanted to ask, have you uh, had the chance to look into associations with uh, olfactory abilities in uh, aged people? 
since uh, olfaction is very much related to cognition uh, and the association between olfaction and hearing has not been studied very well. Yes, I, I think olfaction goes through a similar process as, as uh, vision and, and hearing. Uh, that is an aging, uh, an aging process. So um, um, it would be an obvious choice to, to look at, at whether these processes run in parallel. Um, I don't think a lot of research has been done in, in that domain. Thank you. Any other questions, please uh, help. Yeah, can, can I ask a question? Um, yeah, following the two uh, early questions and from a very, uh, you know, um, more personal than scientific, uh, uh, I got an abstract that's saying that, on the other hand, that uh, hearing problem um, that don't cause dementia can go to the other side and sharpen you are cognition and because you, you are, as I said, you are trying very hard and uh, using some compensation that weren't used in the brain before. I think that that might be a theory. I think to me personally, it, it makes more sense that because you're putting so much effort in, in, in hearing people and listening, that actually um, you know, causes quite a high cognitive load and therefore there's less energy to, to do other things. So, so um, I, I think the current uh, state of the art suggests that it, it's the other way. Thank you. Uh, any other questions? Okay, thank you very much. Uh, and and uh, without further ado, I'd like to invite uh, Chaim Cohen, the Vatlik Center for Drug Development. He's also a member of EMBO and has been awarded the Rappaport Prize for Excellence in the field of biomedical research. And he's also knighted by the Italian Republic uh, for his service to science and society. Um, so thank you, Ehud, uh, for coming to present your work. Yes. Um, and the stage okay. is yours. Thank you, Itamar, for the kind introduction, and thank you, the organizing committee, for the invitation. Thank you, Sarah, for mentioning my talk in Jerusalem. If anybody is interested in an extended version, I would love to share it. Today, I will use my 15 minutes to try to convince you that amyloids are not made only of proteins and peptides, but also of uh, 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 metabolites and non-protein uh, uh, entities. Uh, but I will start with uh, a work on uh, um, uh, proteins and peptides. Uh, usually uh, amyloids that are associated with uh, major human disorders are made of uh, uh, proteins and peptides, 30 or 40 amino acids long or even longer, but it was shown that also shorter peptides uh, could be associated with amyloid disease. And in a reductionist systematic approach over almost two decades, we were able to identify the most fundamental uh, uh, recognition modules in nature that could allow the formation of ordered amyloid fibers. And the first example uh, is uh, related 17 years ago uh, uh, to human calcitonin, which is associated uh, with uh, thyroid carcinoma. Uh, this also relates between amyloid age-related and cancer, as was mentioned by Susan, uh, were the first uh, um, uh, to show that very short uh, uh, peptide, the shortest tetrapeptide and pentapeptide could form typical amyloid fibers. A uh, few years later, or a year later, we were able to show that you can get amyloid-like structures from uh, uh, elements that are even shorter uh, uh, than uh, tetra or pentapeptide, you can go to dipeptide, the shortest you can get uh, with peptides and get amyloid-like properties. Uh, these were nanotubes that were made by, the, uh, 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 by these dipeptides. Uh, uh, three years later, by uh, acetylating and amidating the termini of the peptides, which reflects more uh, 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 the situation in which you have in the, uh, in the uh, uh, 
polypeptide in an intact polypeptide were the first to show that the canonical uh, amyloids could be formed by simply dipeptides. Uh, and, and this is our reductionist uh, uh, scheme moving from, uh, in the top you can see beta amyloid 42 amino acid into a dipeptide. And uh, this is a, a, a very uh, uh, a simple uh, uh, element with not a, a, a interesting fibrillar uh, uh, architecture, but also very interesting physical properties. And the reason this is a, 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 a biology conference, but I show it uh, bearing me a, a few minutes because I will show later how the structures that are being made by the proteins, peptides, and metabolites are just one continuum which uh, uh, correlates. So we saw very strong mechanical properties. We could see piezoelectric properties, which meaning pressing the, 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 the material uh, uh, causing the uh, induction of electric current. Think about the situation in which you have, if you think about amyloids, uh, uh, some induction of uh, unwanted uh, electric current in your brain. And we could see uh, interesting optical properties for these assemblies, uh, even uh, semiconductive uh, uh, properties for these ideas. And those who know me, uh, much of the work done in the lab are related to the nanotechnological uh, aspects of this. But what I'm going to show you today and reflect the last eight years of work in my lab, it was started as a, as a control. We are experimentalists uh, do a lot of controls. Um, so dipeptides is the shortest you can get with a, 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 with a, a peptide fragment. And for many years we were claiming that the reason that these assemblies could form this wonderful uh, uh, proper, uh, uh, assemblies with uh, the interesting biological and uh, physical properties is due to the peptide bond and its uh, uh, um, uh, physical characteristic uh, due to the resonance of uh, uh, partially two-dimensional. And then we ask ourselves whether a single amino acid could form any structures. The, the, uh, the answer should have been no, and this would end uh, the um, uh, the experiment and um, really prove that it's the uh, MI bond that is important for the formation of the structure. Quite to our surprise, we realized that if you take a, a, a single amino acid, in the, in the first case, a, a phenylalanine, it could form amyloid, st form structures that looks and feel like amyloids. And uh, uh, those of you working in the amyloid field, they have the, the um, ultra structural properties as amyloid. If you uh, um, uh, stain them with Congo red dye, you see the, the, the typical apple green virus regions, as you see with amyloid fibers. If you stain it with THT, you see the, uh, um, uh, the um, uh, typical uh, uh, fluorescence. And uh, they also uh, uh, demonstrate typical X-ray uh, electron diffraction pattern, just like amyloid fibers. But the concentration in which these uh, uh, structures were formed was quite high. In, in the range of a, a millimolar, which is not a, the, the physiological concentration of phenylalanine. So we stress, we, we scratch our head to try to think whether there are any conditions, physiological, pathological, in which we see such high concentration of phenylalanine. And indeed there is. In the case of PKU, phenylketonuria, it is a genetic disorder in which you see the accumulation of phenylalanine into high concentration. I will mention it in, in the next slide. And the, uh, um, if uh, phenylketonuria is, uh, is a genetic situation in which the individual lack the uh, enzyme that converts phenylalanine to tyrosine, thus they have high concentration of a, a, a phenylalanine, a, unlike the situation for us, even if we have a very high protein-rich meal, the concentration of phenylalanine are not higher than 80 or 85 micromolar. They have concentration of 1.2 millimolar. And if those individuals are not treated with a very strict diet, they have a very severe 
neurodegenerative uh, uh, symptoms, uh, which reflects in, in a way uh, age-related uh, uh, neurodegeneration. Uh, and uh, uh, then we, we ask whether it is possible that indeed, in the case of the PKU, you have amyloid-like etiology, asking first of all whether you see a, a, any toxicity for these structures. And indeed, we could see toxicity at concentration higher than a, a one millimolar. And just to make sure that it's not by putting such high amount of amino acid that somehow a, a change the balance for, for, the, a, 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 for the cells, uh, we used alanine as a control, uh, which uh, you can put up to 15 millimolar of, uh, of alanine and see uh, no toxic effect. Moreover, we could raise antibodies toward these uh, uh, assemblies, and the antibodies could deplete the toxicity of the, uh, uh, of the structures that were being formed. Moreover, we could use mice model. Uh, uh, mice have just the same uh, uh, phenylalanine uh, uh, tyrosine metabolism uh, as, as we see with uh, uh, human subjects. And uh, we could see the spontaneous uh, uh, appearance of antibodies in PKU model mice, which lack the same enzyme, which means that the formation of these assemblies uh, uh, of the mice. And finally, for the first time, we could demonstrate, due to very tough referees, we could demonstrate the deposition of metabolite amino acid deposits in the brain of a, a, a PKU patients, of course, a, a post mortem. So we had, a, a, which were co stained with Congo red, just as you see with the, the brain of Alzheimer's disease patients. So we could see amyloid like etiology in inborn air of metabolism patients. And uh, uh, later I will uh, uh, connect the, the two phenomena. So if we look, if we go back to our uh, uh, um, amyloid reductionist amyloid scheme, we could go down to a single amino acid. But, and luckily working on very simple model, immediately we had many groups working on this. And uh, this is beautiful work from uh, uh, Mike Bowers in Santa Barbara, which was able to show how the uh, uh, phenylalanine structures are a, a arranged in aqueous solution, which you see for the chemist of you, you see the ar hydrophobic uh, aromatic ring are uh, projected towards the water. That means that they're initially they want thermodynamically to go into membranes, and then you see very strong uh, membrane interaction uh, uh, for the structures, probably the, the basis for the uh, 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 activity for the cytotoxic activity, and we could see it also with model membranes. And this is a, 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 a scheme with a, a, a table in which we compare all the properties that you see with a, a protein based amyloid, and we could see it also with the metabolite amyloid. So, phenylalanine is one example, but unfortunately, there are many inborn of metabolism disorders in which you see. A, a accumulation of different metabolites. Again, in a systematic reductionist approach, we went over the entire list and look for a, a, the ability of other metabolites to form amyloid-like structures. And we indeed, we revealed that not only phenylalanine, but also adenine, a, a orotic acid, cysteine, a tyrosine, uracil, they all form structures that are look like amyloid, they bind a Congo red like amyloid, they bind THT-like amyloids, and they are also cytotoxic as amyloids. And always we have the, the, the excellent uh, a, a, um, control of alanine, which does not form the structure and is not cytotoxic. Not only that were cytotoxic, the mechanism of cytotoxicity was by late apoptosis, just exactly as the uh, um, uh, protein-based uh, amyloids. Now, I remind you that I was speaking about the uh, uh, physical properties of the peptide assemblies. So not only biological properties, uh, same bi biological properties as, as the proteins and peptides we see with the uh, metabolite structures, but also the physical properties, which includes the, the fluorescence. So this is a paper published two years ago in which we, we demonstrated clear fluorescence of the metabolite structures just exactly as we saw, showed a decade ago for the peptide structures and in between the uh, uh, Cambridge group of Kaminsky and Dobson uh, 
uh, were able, uh, groups of Kominsky and Dobson were able to show for a, a protein amyloids. We could, I showed you the mechanical properties. Uh, later on, Thomas Knowles and, and, and from uh, Cambridge and Marcus Zibulio from uh, MIT showed the mechanics of uh, uh, amyloid fibers. We could show it just a few months ago, also with the uh, um, uh, metabolite amyloids. So we see peptides, proteins, metabolites, just a continuum. I saw your appears of electricity, and also this was uh, 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 just two years ago showed by a group in Ireland for metabolite structures. Could also demonstrate the ability to inhibit the, the formation of the, of the structure using polyphenols, as you see with the, uh, with the amyloids. Uh, 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 finally, we could make a yeast model uh, in which you have the accumulation of the structure and, and uh, uh, show the ability to, to rescue the phenotype also with the yeast model. Just in the, in the last two minutes, I want to go back and, uh, and speak about the crosstalk between the metabolites and proteins. And this relates to many uh, unexplained association that we see between metabolites and age-related uh, diseases. This includes high uh, uh, levels of homocysteine in the case of Alzheimer's disease, high level of uh, uh, quinolonic acid in the case of uh, Parkinson's disease. Uh, tyrosine and ALS, uh, uh, various uh, oncometabolites and cancer. The, the, the correlation between cancer and age-related diseases was already mentioned by Susan uh, uh, this morning. What we suggested that it might be that structures that are made by the uh, 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 metabolites could seed the formation of amyloids by proteins and peptides. And it's a theory we had to uh, uh, to demonstrate it. And indeed, in the case of quinolonic acid, we're able to show the formation, again, of amyloid-like structures by those metabolites that are elevated in the case of Parkinson's disease. But much more importantly, we could see the ability of these seeds to accelerate the formation of amyloids by alpha-synuclein, uh, the protein that forms structures in the case of Parkinson's disease. And those of you who are working with this protein, which is much less aggregation prone than as compared to other uh, proteins that it might serve as a seed uh, uh, for the formation of the structures. Lastly, this is a, a collaboration that we had in a group in Rambam a, a, a Medical Center uh, by raising the, meta the metabolite amyloid uh, phenomena were able to explain a, a, a clinical observation that could not uh, uh, be explained in another way. Uh, these are uh, uh, young children with uh, hyperoxaluria. They have a high degree, high uh, a concentration of oxalate in their, um, uh, in their blood and tissues. Usually oxalate uh, uh, accumulation leads to formation of oxalate crystals. But in this case, these children had a very severe uh, um, um, I am um, uh, retinal dysfunction, in spite of the fact that we couldn't see any crystals. We asked ourselves whether there are oxalate fibers, and indeed we could see fibers, amyloid-like fibers that are made by oxalate. And when we, and when we injected the fibers that we made in, uh, 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 synthetically into the eyes of rats, we could get just the same irregular retinal electrical uh, activity as we could see with those children. So this is moving from the uh, bedside to bench and hopefully we could go uh, back. Uh, I would like just to finish by, uh, uh, Leonardo da Vinci was uh, mentioned also <laughs> here. Uh, I had this, uh, uh, this slide before, but I, I think that uh, moving to smaller and smaller and smaller pieces, I can uh, uh, convince you that the simplicity is uh, indeed ultimate sophistication also in the molecular science, not, on, not only in other uh, 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 direction that were mentioned by uh, Da Vinci. Uh, this was, of course, group uh, work by a very talented group. Uh, one picture from some times ago in, in uh, uh, sunny Israel. Uh, and uh, I would like uh, uh, to thank you. and. Uh, Happy to take any questions if there are. Thank you. Thank you so much. Uh, fantastic talk.
Unfortunately, because of uh, our shortage of time, we'll have to uh, um, skip questions and move straight to uh, Yossi's talk. Um, thank you. Thank you again for a fantastic uh, talk. So our next speaker is uh, Professor Yossi Shilo. Uh, Yossi is a member of the Department of Human Molecular Genetics and Biochemistry of the Faculty of Medicine at Tel Aviv University and a member of the Israel National Academy of Sciences and Humanities. Uh, he won many prizes, uh, amongst them uh, are the Annette Prize in Life Sciences, the American Association of Cancer Research Clouds Memorial Award for Outstanding Accomplishments in Cancer Research, and the Israel Prize in Life Sciences, uh, and the Olaf Thorn Prize uh, in, natu in Natural Sciences and Medicine. Um, thank you very much, uh, Yossi, uh, for, for coming to speak in, in the meeting. And the stage is yours. Thank you very much, uh, Itamar. I'll, uh, I cannot share my screen right now. I see. I guess, uh, Udi, can you? OK, let me. And uh, a quick remark, if you do have questions, please contact. Uh, you can even uh, ask questions directly through our chat, either in the general uh, uh, chat or also privately. Okay, so uh, thanks uh, to the organizers, actually, not only for inviting each and every uh, of us, the speakers, but also for being able to organize such a wonderful meeting in these uh, somewhat unusual uh, times. So uh, as you can see from the title, we're interested in another component uh, in the molecular basis of uh, aging, uh, which is genome instability. And uh, our interest in, in this link uh, actually uh, came up just recently. We have always been interested in one specific genome instability syndrome, AT, which I will describe in a minute. But uh, recently it uh, turned out that we cannot avoid the um, uh, dominant component of premature aging in this syndrome and through this, uh, we became interested in this link, which is in the title, and also its implications beyond the rare genome instability syndromes, uh, actually uh, in the area of, uh, of public health. So I'm going back to this already iconic uh, image from this review that was published two years ago about the uh, hallmarks of aging. And now I'm highlighting, of course, uh, genomic instability. Uh, which is becoming, uh, I mean, the awareness of the importance of genomic instability in the, eight, in the pace at which we age and age-associated morbidity, um, the awareness is, is actually growing these days and there are various models to explain how this happens. Uh, obviously, accumulation of DNA damage um, is an obstacle in all aspects of uh, DNA metabolism and also a source of um, uh, accumulation of mutations uh, here, for example, in, in, in the nervous system, somatic mutations. And of course, they are critical in uh, cells, in, in differentiated cells that have to stay and live and function for a long time. Uh, so when speaking about the re uh, cellular response to DNA damage, uh, every talk and every review starts with the uh, environmental DNA damaging agents, the external agents that damage our DNA, most notably uh, UV light. Uh, this is just a reminder that the most abundant environmental carcinogen is sunlight. And here is a classical example, this truck driver uh, who had been driving his truck for 30 years with the left side of his face exposed to the sun. And what we see here is, of course, uh, rapid aging of the uh, exposed tissue, the skin. But in fact, most of the uh, damage that is induced uh, in the DNA of each and every cell in our body as we speak is coming from what we call the enemy from within. Uh, reactive oxygen species, which are byproducts of normal metabolism that attack and damage the DNA constantly, leading to a whole variety of DNA lesions, which are of course repaired uh, via various uh, repair mechanisms. But 
the uh, DNA repair field has undergone transformation in recent years because it became, it became clear that in addition to the re actual repair at the site of the damage, there is a lot of going on in terms of signal transduction. And these are huge networks that in fact affect every single aspect of cellular metabolism while the DNA lesion is repaired. And the most impressive network is the one that is uh, initiated by the ATM protein kinase, our favorite protein, which I'll discuss in a second, in response to a critical DNA lesion, the double strand break. But you can have the impression from these uh, very simple diagrams that there are, there's numerous proteins that are involved in this response, meaning there are numerous genes encoding these uh, proteins that can be mutated in many ways, leading to reduced efficiency uh, of maintaining genome stability. And in given the high number of genes and proteins and polymorphisms and mutations, obviously this is becoming individual almost as a fingerprint. I mean, the final phenotype, which is the efficiency at which we handle this constant attack on, on the integrity and the stability of our genome. The most striking examples are, of course, these monogenic so-called genome instability syndromes, which are characterized by sensitivity to genotoxic stresses, tissue degeneration, and among others, premature aging. Now, moving from these rare syndromes to, to the public, uh, obviously heterozygosity for these mutations, which is much more common than homozygosity, or any other combinations of mutations in these genes can lead to a whole variety of phenotypes in the general population. Now I'm speaking about general morbidity and indeed premature aging is becoming now part of this. So uh, just bear in mind that the, the load of these uh, mutations or the polymorphisms and sequence variations in the genes that are responsible for maintaining the stability and integrity of our genome on public health is quite considerable. So now I'm, I'm, uh, uh, I'll speak only about one single gene and disease. This is the disease that I've been studying for many years since I was grad student, AT, and, uh, and this is a autosomal recessive disease. And you can see that it is highly pleiotropic affecting numerous systems uh, in the human body with very complex and devastating phenotype, neurodegeneration, immune deficiency, and among others, the premature aging aspect, which again became apparent only recently. Um, a while ago, we cloned the responsible gene, called it ATM, which stands for AT mutated. And uh, we and others found that the ATM protein, which is a protein kinase, it actually um, uh, involved in numerous aspects of cellular metabolism, uh, including maintenance of genome stability. It is the primary inducer of the double strand break response, but in fact is involved also in the response to other types of DNA lesion. And uh, I think Chaim already showed uh, um, uh, an image of an orchestra as a metaphor to what they do. And this is also uh, my favorite metaphor for ATM as a conductor of an orchestra. Um, in this image, this is of course Maestro Abado, Claudio Abado, conducting um, Mahler's Eighth Symphony, this a symphony of a thousand, because you need thousand musicians or artists on the stage to, to perform it. And believe it or not, ATM has more than thousand substrates. Now, uh, forget for a moment the symptoms that I just shown you. When uh, 80 patients advance in age during the second and third decade of life, they develop a whole array of new symptoms. And if you look just at these symptoms, obviously the first thing that comes to mind is premature aging, which led me a few years ago to write uh, this review. And uh, now moving again back from the patients who are homozygotes for these null alleles of ATM to the heterozygotes, whose frequency in the population is larger. My estimate that, for example, in the Israeli population, we have some 10,000 carriers of this gene. 
So what about these individuals? Does heterozygosity to these mutations contribute uh, to their phenotype? Obviously, by definition, uh, 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 autosomal recessive allele uh, should not be, should have much effect on, on the phenotype. But uh, people became interested in the possibility that heterozygosity for these mutations uh, confers cancer predisposition. And this is why we became interested in this some 22 years ago and started this study, which is still going on. Uh, we started it in two uh, Palestinian Arab communities, each of which has its own mutation. And uh, this was carried out initially in collaboration with the late Professor Baruch Modan, and now with uh, Professor Sigal Sadetsky. I guess the Israeli um, people in the audience uh, by now know her name very well. So uh, this is a cohort of uh, these two communities in, in which, which is more than 800 people, in, in which there are 105 carriers. So obviously, the carrier frequency is high. And we, we saw right away from the start in the first interview that there was excess of cardiovascular diseases uh, among the carriers. This is a careful, carefully controlled uh, study because the, the, homozygous, the homozygous for the normal allele, they are in the same families, they live in the same area. So these are perfectly controlled. And since then, we have been following quietly the occurrence of cancers in this cohort using the national cancer registry. And you can see what's, what's happening here. And as you can see, we, we had to wait this long time in order to let this cohort age and reveal this phenotype. I guess we may not be aware of the fact that while we're letting this cohort age, we're aging ourselves as well. But anyway, like I said, this is a carefully controlled epidemiologic uh, study. And there's a whole array of cancers that emerge in these, in these individuals, not only breast cancer. And now let me show you some old data. This, is, this actually goes back to my PhD thesis, but so I apologize for showing old data, but I thought that uh, it's quite appropriate to show old data in an aging meeting, right? So what I did here is survival curves of cell lines, fibroblast cell lines as a function of uh, treatment with increasing doses of x-rays or the radiomimetic drug. And this is the normal range. There's always a range because people, people actually show high variability in their sensitivity to these agents. And this is the AT range. These are extremely high as radiosensitive or radiomimetic sensitive cell lines. But look what's going on with the heterozygotes. They are sort of in between. So uh, they do show moderate sensitivity to, to these agents, which probably translates into a radiation reaction if these individuals undergo radiotherapy. So you can, and by the way, some of these people are included in this study. So all in all, you can see uh, a cellular phenotype, which reflects the reduced efficiency to cope with double strand breaks, which is quite expected. And the morbidity phenotype. But this is, remember, this is part of the general population. This is actually on a background, a very noisy background of the general morbidity uh, that we see in public health. But here we were able to isolate this group, uh, which is different from the rest of the people only by one aspect. They are carriers of one single null allele in one locus. And this is what's happening. And now, if you think again about hundreds and hundreds of genes that are involved in this, you can imagine uh, how these mutations, that all of them, all of them affecting uh, the efficiency at which we maintain genome stability, how they affect morbidity, including uh, aging pace. So our models in the lab are obviously cell lines and animals. I, we're doing a great deal of work with mouse models. I won't discuss our mouse work today at all, but I, I go back, I'll go back to, uh, to the initial uh, tissue culture model, which are primary uh, fibroblasts that we are used to establish from skin biopsies. And what I noticed, like in many labs, that at early passage level, uh, cells from AT patients slow their growth, they obtain this 
um, not so nice appearance, became flat. And this is already what we call already at that time senescence. The term senescence had already been established enough to be included in the title of that paper. But at that time, we didn't know much about senescence and there were no good readouts, especially not ones that uh, we could quantitate. There was only this appearance of the cell, which is more like gut feeling, but what else could we say? So I had to invent a, a readout for the uh, premature senescence of AT fibroblasts. And I found uh, one and it was their ability to form colonies. So the plating efficiency of AT cells uh, was going down rapidly, sharply, long before I could see this overt senescence in culture. And of course, much earlier compared to wild type cells. And by the way, the carriers were again, sort of in between. So now we know, we know much more about cellular senescence, this irreversible cell cycle arrest coupled with um, a very striking phenotype uh, of um, secretion of a whole suite of cytokines called senescence associated secretory phenotype or SASP. It may be reversible in malignant states. This is a hot issue. I won't uh, get in, into this. And it can be induced by a whole variety of stresses, uh, genotoxic stresses and, and others. And in fact, it's part of normal development and normal life. But cell senescence has this Janus phase because it has a dark side and a bright side. On one hand, it plays important roles in embryonic development, tissue repair, tumor suppression, and removal of damaged cells from tissue as, expect, as expected. But on the other hand, it causes degenerative and especially inflammatory processes, probably mainly by uh, SASP. And so uh, this is of course a very hot field and uh, senescence is not synonymous with, with aging, but we now know that the proportion or the, the amount of senescent cells incre in, is in, increased in, uh, in uh, the elderly. So I have the very special privilege, which is quite an enjoyable, to go back now in my own lab with, uh, with our students, uh, to the project that I kind of stopped uh, a while ago, closing full circle. And this is being done by uh, two excellent grad students, Maj Haj and uh, Jan Frey, who came to us from France. And of course, uh, our dedicated scientific uh, lab manager, Yael, who most of you know, uh, is involved in, 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 in the daily instruction and actually leading this project. And by the way, as you can see, uh, Maj is not only a talented grad student, but also a very a talented, gifted musician. This beautiful instrument, by the way, is an oud. And we enjoy a wonderful collaboration on the bioinformatics side of this project with Rani Alconofra Group, and we have a joint grad student, uh, Amit. So I won't show you too much data because this is, this is supposed to be a short lecture. First question was, is this indeed senescence? And Maj was growing the cells now we grow them either in, in ambient oxygen uh, atmosphere or under reduced uh, oxygen pressure. And I can tell you right there that, that it is a much better idea to grow fibroblasts, especially primary fibroblasts under 3% oxygen. And we have a group here of uh, wild type and ATM deficiencies are AT patients and heterozygotes and note that uh, you would expect the ATM level to be about 50%. It's actually variable in, in these, at least in these three heterozygotes. And I'll get back to that later. So, um, and uh, we now, of course, are equipped with many more senescence readouts. These are just, a f just four of the numerous readouts that Maj is, is using. And the answer is yes, it is indeed senescence. Uh, first, Maj was able to confirm my old results and it was really uh, um, nice to uh, hear him say, uh, he was saying to me, I can confirm your results, you were right at that time. And this is EDU incorporation, uh, which is a very accurate measure of cellular proliferation. Again, there's difference between growing cells growing under 20% under, under and, and 
3% and 20%, but even the reduced uh, oxygen pressure cannot alleviate this uh, tremendous uh, acceleration of uh, senescence in AT cells. And this is one of the ultimate measures, the uh, senescence associated beta gall staining, which is actually a mirror image because obviously in the AT cells, it goes up more than 20% and in 3%. In fact, we're now confining all our studies to 3%. And since we're looking at genome instability syndrome, obviously what we see in the AT cells is increased um, level of uh, these damage, res damage response readouts. In this case, uh, they stand for double strand breaks. These nuclear fossae of phosphorylated histone H2AX and the damage response factor 53 BP1, uh, which are actually persistent in, in these cells. And then now the, the, the last slide, uh, what about the carriers? We always go back to these carriers. So this is a complex slide, but to cut long story short, uh, there is much find a found a correlation between ATM level, which is variable in these three heterozygotes, and the degree of acceleration or the severity of their senescence. Obviously, there is inverse uh, correlation, again, emphasizing in a very, in a very fine way uh, the importance of the modulation of the DNA damage response and senescence in this case, and we can obviously translate it to back to the organismal phenotype, which I'd show you before. So this project is now, of course, branching in numerous directions, as you could see from our many collaborations uh, with regard to this. This is uh, truly an, a, a very important uh, link uh, that is now arising in the aging field, and I think uh, this is the time to uh, show you our team. We're still doing uh, ATM signaling and looking uh, very deeply into the cerebellar degeneration in AT, which is still an unsolved problem and may be also linked to the premature aging of this, in this disease. And this is our funding sources. And I think I'm ready to take some questions if there is time. Thank you very much, Yossi. Uh... So with the lack of, because of the lack of time, we'll ask questions uh, in the chat. Um, I apologize for that. And, uh, but thank you again for a fantastic uh, talk and overview of, of the field. Um, our next and last speaker is Martin Hyde. Uh, just to remind you, don't leave after his talk. Uh, um, there's going to be closing remarks by Karen at the end. Um, so Martin is an associate professor in gerontology at uh, Swansea University. His main research interests are uh, work and retirement in global context. He's on the advisory panel of the Iranian Longitudinal Survey of Aging and the New Zealand Longitudinal Study of Aging. He's on the executive committee of the British, British Society of Gerontology and a fellow of the Gerontological Society of America. He's also a chair of the Welsh Ministerial Advisory Forum on Aging Group on Preparing for the Future. He's a deputy editor uh, for several journals, including Aging and Society, and on the editorial boards of the International Journal of Social Research Methodology and Quality in Aging and in Older Adults. So thank you very much, and um, the stage is yours. So, um, Prion Dar from Sunny Wales, and thank you very much to the organizers of the conference, uh, not just for the opportunity to participate on what has been an absolutely fascinating uh, two days of talks, but also for the opportunity for me to revisit the topic that really started my academic career and looking at quality of life in later life. Certainly the uh, disadvantage of going last on two days is that I am painfully aware that I am keeping you from your lunch or afternoon coffees, depending on what time zone you're in. But the advantage is that you get to listen to everything that has gone before and make slight changes uh, to my uh, presentation. So this is a very multidisciplinary um, audience. So I thought that rather than 
give the talk that I'd originally planned, which was much more sort of empirically focused, was to try to step back a little bit and reflect on what quality of life is, why it's important, also how it might form a bridge through which the number of the um, presentations and topics that have been discussed over the last two days might connect, but also to think forward about how quality of life could form the basis of potential collaborations for future projects within this network and possibly beyond. So I think for a while there's been a realization that advances in life expectancy and healthy life expectancy have been very much welcomed, that these are seen quite rightly as a success of um, social institutions, medical practice, policy reforms, but that when we're thinking about what it is we want to achieve with our po aging populations, that we need to go more broadly than this. And I think the, the slogan that's been used, and I think is quite appropriate, is that we need not just to add life to years, but we need to add years to life as well. Oh, sorry, we need to not just add uh, years to life, but add life to years. So this is enshrined in a number of high level policy documents through international organizations like the WHO and the International Plan of Action on Aging, where quality of life has been seen as a major outcome that we should be striving to improve alongside improvements in life expectancy and healthy life expectancy. Yeah, I would say that despite this tremendous policy push at international and national levels, we're still at the stage where we're not quite sure whether improvements in life and quality of life have kept pace with improvements in life expectancy and healthy life expectancy, and particularly for uh, looking at which groups have and haven't experienced improvements in quality of life. I also think that having, again, listened to the tremendous presentations that have gone on over the last uh, two days, the quality of life could be, and in fact I think is, a common potential outcome measure for a number of the topics that have been discussed. So I had actually uh, put a number of hyperlinks in to papers that reflect each of the dimensions that I've been thinking about, but there was a very nice paper that came out from some Swedish colleagues last, uh, last month about the impact of informal caring on, um, on quality of life. And I suppose to some extent, unsurprisingly, found that those people that had to undertake levels of informal care and the degree to which people were engaged in informal care had a negative impact on people's quality of life. Thinking about Tarani's presentation on health inequalities, we also see that inequalities in quality of life are um, follow similar types of sociodemographic inequalities. And there's a nice paper by Claire uh, Neandovic from the European Consortium looking at how that those inequalities um, differ across different welfare states in Europe. There's also quite a bit of work looking at um, cardiovascular and auditory and um, macular degeneration connections uh, with quality of life, showing again that those people that have uh, these conditions are also likely to report lower levels of quality of life. And there's an emerging and I think very interesting area of research around dementia related quality of life um, again, tending to show that people who are living with dementia tend to report lower levels of quality of life, but this is often problematized by the fact that in many cases, these are taken as proxy measures from carers. So I think there's some really interesting methodological innovations in looking at how we can measure quality of life in people who might have impaired cognitive function. So if that was the case, if, if we all agreed that quality of life is important and we all agreed on what quality of life was, this would be the end of a very short presentation. But as with everything, when you get into these sorts of concepts and topics, you realize that there is a lot of disagreement and ambiguity about what is meant by quality of life. There's a long running, I think, um, debate that's gone all the way back to when I started working in this field and before about whether quality of life is an objective, sort of measurable, codifiable um, concept, or whether it is purely subjective phenomena 
that relies on the individual's own preferences and um, ideals. Whether we should look at quality of life simply in certain domains or whether what we're talking about is a more general philosophical position about the meaning of life in general. And I would say that within the field, and I'll touch on this a little bit more as we go through the talk, that there is an awareness that quality of life is more than those basic needs. So going back to thinking about health, I think most of us would realize that health is an important element in aging, but that quality of life is more than just good health. And it connects with other um, issues such as well-being, life satisfaction, happiness, sense of purpose. So going beyond those kind of basic ideas. And generally the awareness that quality of life is a multi-dimensional concept because it has to reflect all those different dimensions of life which are important for us. So there are a number of different ways in which people have thought about measuring quality of life. And I would say from my sort of review of the literature over the last 20 years or so, that there are four main approaches in which people try to measure this in surveys. And I should say that I am a kind of survey researcher. And so my top, my area of interest is how we, we do this in a quantitative way. Although it should be said, I think there are relatively few studies with older adults that have looked at quality of life from qualitative uh, perspective. So maybe that is something where there, again, there is room for um, development. But within survey research, I would say that there are these four main approaches that either quality of life is taken as a very domain specific uh, approach. So looking at like health related quality of life or even condition related quality of life, as I said, around Alzheimer's disease. And I came across a care related quality of life scale in preparing for this presentation, which looks at the quality of life of people who are in um, uh, living in care homes. Then there are the single item or global measures of quality of life that just ask one single question about how satisfied you are with your quality of life. And again, whilst these are somewhat commonly used, I think most of the people that work in this field are wary of them because they don't necessarily capture that multi-dimensionality of quality of life, which is when we start to get into those more composite or what I call sort of shopping cart uh, measures where people collect a number of different domains, health, social networks, uh, financial situation, living conditions, and try to get some kind of global measure of how well people feel they're doing across all these domains. And that then creates a measure of quality of life. And within that, I'd say there are two main approaches. One where those composite uh, factors, those kind of the, the things you put in the shopping cart are defined by the researchers a priori. And we see examples of that with, uh, for example, the World Health Organization's uh, qual old measure or whether they're sort of respondent defined. So people go out and they do focus groups or interviews with older adults in order to identify those factors that they feel are important, then operationalize those into measurable uh, questions within surveys. And there was one done several years ago by Anne Bowling and her team in the UK, which produced this older people's quality of life questionnaire. But there are others that are out there as well. And then I would say that there are a few that are more explicitly theoretically or philosophically informed, which is where I place the scale that I helped to develop the CASP 19, which has a very clear um, philosophical rationale for the, 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 the indicators that are included um, and are seen to be separable from those factors that might impact on quality of life. I found a very interesting systematic review of scales that have been used that was published, uh, I think, last year by Harold Stad and colleagues, which I think rather disappointingly um, reported that only 25% of studies gave a reason for their choice of instrument. So again, when we're thinking about maybe trying to compare or think what it, thinking about what it is we're measuring, people aren't very forthcoming about that. And even fewer provided a definition of the concept. So again, sort of taking these off the peg measures and using them in our in our studies, I think is potentially problematic because we're not able to really question what it is that we are trying uh, to measure. In terms of where we are, the evidence around what impacts on quality of life, certainly the socioeconomic factors, I think these follow a fairly similar pattern to those, uh, again, shown by Tarani, 
that those in lower socioeconomic positions, those with lower levels of social participation, poor health and functioning, and depression are all connected with lower levels of um, quality of life. And there's some very interesting research that's just come out again in the last year or so from researchers at UCL looking at the relationship between age, ageism or age discrimination and quality of life. And again, finding that, that has a negative uh, impact on people's quality of life. And given um, the, the introduction to today's session by uh, Professor Harper uh, and the, 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 the very, I think, tangible rise in ageist discourse and attitudes that we've seen over the last um, sort of six months, particularly, I think, connected to COVID, but showing the persistence of those ideas. I think those are some very worrying um, results that are coming out. And then I thought I'd also just kind of say that people have tried to turn that around a little. So again, a very nice study from colleagues at UCL, Paolo Zaninotto and Andrew Septo. They've looked at how quality of life or some components thereof might actually feed back into some of those um, biological outcomes and how they might look, how they might be connected to uh, increases in life expectancy. And then again, to sort of to pick up the, the point that um, Professor Harper made again at, at the top of the talk, at the top of the session, really, about life course uh, factors. And she's completely right. We don't simply arrive at later life. We don't become old on one particular day, but we all get here and we all get here by different routes. Some of those are more advantageous than others. And there is a growing body of evidence, though I think there's still lots of work to be done, particularly as more of these life course data come on stream to look at the impact of life course factors on quality of life in later life. But what we know already is that those who experience adversity in childhood are less likely to have a good quality of life in later life. So a very long reach, very long shadow of those early uh, experiences of adversity, but also, and again, relating to what Tarani said around kind of health in retirement, that people who have less advantageous working uh, positions or poor uh, uh, lower labor market statuses during that period of midlife are also more likely to report quality of life, uh, poor quality of life in later life as they get into retirement. But it should be said, just like the way in which quality of life is uh, very contested, the different models that are used to look at um, life course factors are also very different. So again, another systematic review that included 12 studies that have looked at life course um, factors on quality of life found five or four different ways of looking at the life course. And again, sort of variability in the numbers or the proportion of, of studies that chose different models. So again, I think there's work to be done to maybe harmonize or to look across the various values of those approaches to understanding the life course, as well as thinking about how um, we think about quality of life in general. So I think we are moving. I think there's many more studies that are being uh, published on quality of life, certainly since I started, and particularly measures of quality of life that go beyond those domain specific or condition specific uh, foci. Um, but I still think there's lots to do. So I'd just like to give kind of my idea about some of the areas where I think there are potential for more research to be done, hopefully sort of collaborative research within this network or beyond. I think we need to know about how quality of life changes as we age. So at the moment, quality of life is often seen as an end point. So we look at all the factors that lead up to uh, people's quality of life in later life, and, and we don't go beyond that. And I think we, we need to look at how quality of life evolves through later life. And I'm very excited to be working with a team in New Zealand um, on the New Zealand Longitudinal Study of Aging, where we've taken a sort of mixed uh, growth mixture model approach to look at different empirically driven trajectories of quality of life. And one of the most exciting things about that is we find trajectories that show improvements in quality of life. And a lot of what's been talked about the last two days, understandably, has been about arresting declines in, in health uh, and for physical functioning as we age. But it's really encouraging to me to see that certain groups are able to improve their quality of life as they go through later life. So it's important to think about how we can learn from that to improve people's quality of life. I'd like to see more sit or some systematic reviews looking at the factors that are associated with quality of life so we can better design policies and practices to intervene on those groups that are, are at risk of having poor quality of life. There's lots of systematic reviews out there around more kind of condition specific measures of quality of life, but I was unable to find one that looked at 
those more generic um, or philosophically particularly grounded measures of quality of life. So I think there's work to be done there that could in turn drive further research. I'd also be interested to look to see whether the factors that are associated with better or worse quality of life are the same for different subgroups in the population and particularly for those with chronic illness. So I wonder whether the factors that relate to quality of life for someone who is fit and healthy and able to get out and about are the same for those people that um, are limited by some kind of health condition and whether they find other ways to achieve good quality of life. So again, not assuming that poor health is necessarily um, a driver of, of, of quality of life, but there might be other compensatory uh, mechanisms that could take place. And again, I think, you know, it's been mentioned a number of times during the last two days that the conditions that we're living in are unusual. But there's also a, there's a, a sense that beyond the immediate um, COVID related changes that we've been living through changing times, I think, certainly since the great financial crisis, particularly in the labor market and the rise of more precarious um, jobs and maybe the coming rise of more automated or digital jobs might introduce new life course risks for um, poorer quality of life. So again, thinking about how new cohorts of people entering the workforce might experience new forms of risk or disadvantage and how they might impact on quality of life in later life. I think there's work to be done there. And then finally, I think, you know, thinking about how we can connect the biosocial factors, many of the things that sort of people have talked about today to these uh, quality of life outcomes. And you know, I'm thinking uh, the presentation um, by uh, Professor Greenfield talking about you know, neurodegenerative uh, decline. And, and you know, what I took from that was, yes, you know, this, is, this is hugely important, but addressing that wasn't necessarily the, the sole aim in itself, but it was, as you said, to allow people to have healthy uh, aging and to allow those people who might otherwise be caring for them to have a good later life. So how can we think about the connections between those biosocial factors and improvements in our maintenance in quality of life uh, as we age? And then the last uh, point that I want to, to get to is again to sort of, to, and I think this is an ideal forum to raise this, although probably not to, to answer it, is whether quality of life is a universal or whether it's culturally specific. And I think this was already raised or this is there's been points during the last few days where people have, have questioned the transferability or the generalizability of findings across different groups and across different cultures. And I think that's particularly the case for quality of life. And although a number of uh, existing scales have raised this issue, I would say none of them have adequately addressed it. And during lockdown, I've, um, I've taken to listening to a lot of audio books to try and get through being uh, stuck in my house. And one of the ones that's profoundly affected me is this one by an Eng uh, English philosopher, Julian Baghini, on how the world thinks. And it's made me think about, well, how do we think about quality of life? And I would argue they are, that how we th think about quality of life reflects how we think about a good life. And that is rooted in our ideas and philosophical traditions within different cultures, not to reify those, because there are lots of crossover in, in, in thinking across different cultures, but there are also some differences between the ways in which different cultures and communities think. And I think it would be really interesting to think about quality of life in particular, or I think I would argue gerontology in general, uh, what that might look like if we approached it from these other cultural vantage points, rather than what it's been over the past sort of, you know, 40, 50 years, which has been largely dominated by sort of more Western, sort of North American, West European ways of thinking. And I think quality of life, again, could offer a really interesting opportunity uh, to have those discussions about a more inclusive, diverse um, gerontological uh, uh, endeavor. So, Diochenval, thank you, and, and Tora uh, for listening. Uh, I appreciate we probably don't have time for many questions, but if you want to get in touch with me, please feel free to either drop it in on chat or email me or get me on Twitter. Thank you so much, Martin. I think it was a, a great uh, concluding talk. And uh, thank you for everyone for this uh, fantastic session and for the last uh, two days. 
And I think I'll give the stage to uh, Karen. Wonderful, thank you. And Itamar and Mira, thank you for sharing today. And I'm sorry we had to cut questions, but we're already quite late and I know that people are eager to continue on with their day. So I just want to very briefly really thank so much BIRAX, the UK Science and Innovation Network, the British Council. You really made this possible, continuing the healthy aging conferences that we've had at Tel Aviv University, but you've inspired us to have yet another one by Zoom and certainly uh, providing all the support that we need for the one that we're going to have hopefully in person in June. I also want to thank Ambassador Wigan for the greetings yesterday to Dame Shirley Porter. Both of you had such wise words and were very inspiring. Shirley, we wish you an incredible birthday and we look forward to celebrating with you. And I wish I could, I could mention each of you uh, speakers by name, but we don't have enough time. You are all really remarkable. I think the breadth and the variety and the quality and the excellence of what you talked about was really captivating. And so I'm gonna leave you with a goodbye message. Thank you for joining us for the last two days. We will have the recording available on our website. So you'll be able to see these lectures uh, at your leisure time again, or for the first time, if you missed it the first time around. And most of all, keep healthy and keep safe, everyone. Goodbye. Thank you. Thank you, Karen. Thank you. Thank you, Karen. Bye, everyone. Wonderful day. Thank you. Thank you. כל הכבוד, עבודה נפלאה, שאפו.